It's a pleasure to be here today. So, several years ago, I got interested in the question of, is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? And what I hope to convince you by the end of today's lecture is that the answer is yes. Um, to make sense of this first question, we have to ask a few more. First of all, what is a black hole? Second, why might one exist at the center of our galaxy? And third, what is the proof? And of course, this has to be proof, and other than that, often found in academic hallways. So a black hole. A black hole is a region of space where the pull of gravity is so intense that nothing can escape it, not even light. So we can't see it directly, which makes them very difficult to study. So while black holes are, rel are relatively exotic objects, the way I want you to think about a black hole today is that it's an object whose mass is confined to zero volume. So this means that the density goes to infinity. This in physics is known as a singularity and basically tells us that our description of the physical world isn't quite right near these objects. So it's the hope of general relativity, the study of things with a lot of gravity, and, uh, and the hope of uh, quantum mechanics, study of things that are very small, when these two fields can meet each other that will actually understand what a black hole is. Fortunately for me, today I get to um, skip over the small detail that we actually can't describe what a black hole is. Because while it has no finite size itself, in spite of the fact that I'm going to tell you about things that are super massive, there is a size that is associated with a black hole. And this is known as the event horizon, or otherwise known as the short chill radius. Um, and this is the last surface which we can, um, light can escape it. So in fact, we can't learn anything inside um, this, this point. It's also conceptually a very important uh, radius because it's the radius to which um, you have to compress an object for it to become a black hole. In other words, once you get a mass down to its short shield radius, it has no other choice but to become a black hole because gravity overcomes all other known forces. So this also is the, uh, the contents of the basic proof of a black hole. I have to show that there's a lot of mass in, contained with inside the short chill radius. And this su size depends only on the mass. The larger the mass, the, the larger the short chill radius. So for example, if I were to figure out how to um, confine the Earth down to the scale of its short chill radius, which corresponds to the size of a sugar cube, it would be forced to become a black hole. Similarly, if I could figure out how to uh, compress the sun down to the size of roughly a university campus, um, then it would become a black hole. So this is the thing to keep in mind as you listen to this talk, that the proof of a black hole is to show that a large amount of mass is confined to within, within its short chill radius. So I started this talk off saying that I'm interested in no ordinary black holes, but rather supermassive black holes. And it turns out that black holes come in two flavors, the ordinary ones. And these are um, the ones that were predicted by theory a priori. It was recognized that very massive stars end their lives as black holes. These are, um, they explode, so we see the remnants on the pl uh, in the sky in such as these uh, pictures here. Um, and what's left in the middle is a black hole that has mass roughly three to ten times the mass of the sun. We call these stellar remnants, they're ordinary black holes. The supermassive ones are thought to be contained at the center of galaxies. And in this relatively famous picture in the astronomical world, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see that galaxies come in all shapes and sizes. You might notice a galaxy, a spiral-shaped galaxy up in the top um, left corner there. That galaxy contains roughly 100 million stars. So these are, are rel uh, relatively enormous uh, scales compared to the ordinary black holes. And in a few examples of these um, galaxies, roughly 10% of all galaxies, these are known as active galactic nuclei because their nuclei, their centers are active. Um, and we think that that um, activity at the center of the galaxy, which comes in a few forms, first at the center of the galaxy, which you see here is a dot, and that's roughly the scale of the optical picture that I showed you a moment ago. And that's where all the stars live. So at the center of the galaxy, we see emission that's unlike anything that can be produced by starlights. 
And um, more, maybe more dramatically are these jets of emission that come out from the center of the galaxy. And so we can figure out how much energy um, is coming out. So what we know is that there has to be a tremendously powerful central engine to explain this phenomena. So it's thought that supermassive black holes are the central engine, and the mass that's needed to drive all this activity is roughly a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So these are much um, different than the ordinary black holes holes, and these were identified observationally, and now the theorists have to come around and explain how we get these things. And I should also note that while at the center of these galaxies we see emission, we're not seeing light directly from the black hole, because remember, you can't see, light can't be emitted by the black hole. What we're seeing here is material accreting down onto the black hole, so you're seeing that um, material uh, basically emit energy. So that notion that maybe the active galaxies have supermassive black holes have been, has been around for quite a while, and it was roughly 30 years ago that people started to ask, is it not only just these prima donnas of the extragalactic world, but rather all galaxies that harbor uh, supermassive black holes, and in normal galaxies like our own, um, are they quiet simply, beca um, uh, simply because they're not accreting? In other words, could all galaxies have supermassive black holes, and the, little, uh, and the ones in the center of these galaxies, um, could these one, uh, be simply ones that are on a diet? And if we're going to ask about these supermassive black holes in normal galaxies, our Milky Way is certainly the best place to answer it, because it's the closest example of the center of a galaxy we're ever going to have to study. The next closest galaxy is 100 times further away, so that we have the advantage of proximity. But also, as you can see in this picture that shows the plane of the galaxy, um, we also have the disadvantage that we live within our galaxy. There's a tremendous amount of dust along our line of sight, and that um, obscures our vision. We're here in, uh, well, I, I should say I live in Southern California. I understand this phenomena quite well. It's just like smog, and just like um, uh, smog, if you go longward of what your eye detects to the infrared, you can actually overcome the problem of the dust in the plane of the galaxy. So how do you find something you can't see? Um, the answer here is to watch how stars near the, uh, the center of the galaxy move. The stars orbit uh, the center of the galaxy just in the same, as, as in the same way that the uh, or, uh, planets orbit the sun. And each orbit allows us to weigh the mass that's inside its orbit. So in other words, um, the, if there is a black hole, the closer you, you get to the black hole, the shorter the orbital period is going uh, to become, and the more massive the black hole is, the, um, the more quickly um, those stars are going to um, orbit. So these stars are the key to the experiment because they both give us the size. The closest star that I can measure tells you how close I've gotten to the black hole. And remember, I'd like to f confine the black hole to within its short shield radius, and how fast it's going around is going to tell me how much mass is inside the orbit. So that's the key. So that means that I'm inward bound. I want to see the stars that are as close to the center of the galaxy as possible. But the ch and so you might think, well, why wasn't this experiment done eons ago? And the challenge is simply that there are a lot of stars at the center of the galaxy. And um, as this picture hopefully shows you, the center of the galaxy is in the lower right. As you go towards the center of the galaxy, there's more and more stars. So you become, um, the astronomers have a, a term for this, you become confusion limited. It's how I feel some days. But it simply means that you can't distinguish the individual stars. So we need um, higher spatial resolution, so we need a large telescope. Um, so fortunately, we have the Keck telescopes. These are the largest telescopes in the world. Um, and as you know, in the world of astronomy, um, uh, with telescopes, bigger is indeed better. Um, because, and there are two campaign promises of telescopes. One is that you can see very faint things, and the other is that you can see um, very um, uh, fine detail, very high angular resolution. And while the first has been easy to achieve, the second has been much more difficult. Um, and that's because of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere distorts incoming wave fronts uh, coming in to us. So these are pictures of the center of the galaxy. There are five very bright stars that you can see. It's a, a sequence of images that we took that are basically a tenth of a second each. If there were no atmosphere, each star would be the size of the smallest structure that we're seeing, the uh, smallest speckle that we're seeing. Uh, but because of the atmosphere, they get um, distorted, and you lose about a factor of 20 in angular resolution. 